Okay, if we think about this mutation selection balance that we've been considering, those deleterious alleles are in a population, and a population full of segregating deleterious alleles, so in other words, where a bunch of individuals have some of these deleterious alleles, even if they're recessive, they'll be producing homozygous offspring that express these traits, a population with a whole bunch of these segregating deleterious alleles is actually less fit, on average, than a population that didn't. And so we would actually we term this, um, we say that that population carries a genetic load. So that's a technical term for when a population has a lower fitness than it could potentially have because it has a large number of individuals with these deleterious alleles. And we're going to represent this genetic load with this value L as the max, which represents the maximum fitness minus the mean fitness relative to the maximum fitness. So this number is representing how much lower the mean fitness of the population is compared to what it could be if none of the individuals are segregating these deleterious alleles. So for, now let's think about for non-recessive deleterious alleles, so let's um, Think of our fitness as 1, 1 minus HS, 1 minus S, where H is not going to be equal to 0. Um, we could take these fitnesses, plug them in there, and we could actually solve for what this genetic load is. And the only hard part of this is calculating the mean fitness. So the mean fitness, remember, is, w, is P squared, W11 plus 2PQ, W12 plus Q squared, W. 2, 2, and we can substitute these in, so p squared times 1, 2 p q, 1 minus h s, plus q squared, 1 minus s, multiplying everything out, 2 p q times 1, minus 2 p q h s, plus q squared, minus s q squared, and we can simplify because we have this and this and this, which add up to 1. 1 minus 2pqhs minus sq squared. And we can do another one of these approximations because we have two terms here. This term has the q. Remember, q is going to be small because that's representing the frequency of the deleterious allele. So this last term is going to be much smaller than this term, so we'll approximate that as 0 and neglect that last term. 1 minus 2pqhs, and we can substitute in. We know that p is equal to 1 minus q, so we can make that substitution. 1 minus 2, 1 minus q, q, h, s. Multiplying that out, 1 minus 2qhs plus 2q squared hs. And we actually know what these q's are because we're solving this at equilibrium. So we know that those values there were this. So we can substitute that in there. 1 minus 2 mu over hs times hs plus 2 mu over hs squared times hs. That cancels with that. And then over here, if we think about this numerator, this is the mutation rate, and we're squaring it, so a mutation rate squared will be tiny. So this term will be much, much smaller than this term here. So we're going to do another one of these approximations because of the mutation rate. So that leaves us with 1 minus 2 mu. So let's think about what we were doing in the first place. We were trying to get the genetic load. So that means that L is equal to W max, the maximum fitness, which was 1, right? That's what the population would have if nobody had the deleterious allele, minus the mean fitness, which is now this, 
1 minus 2 mu, all divided by the maximum fitness. So that's 1 minus 1 plus 2 mu, all over 1, cancel, cancel, 2 mu over 1 is just 2 mu. So this genetic load, this reduction in the mean fitness for a population, because of these deleterious alleles, this genetic load is just twice the mutation rate. So the first interesting thing here is the genetic load doesn't depend on S, just mu. And this is really kind of a surprise, right? We would have perhaps thought that how bad these alleles were in the homozygotes would have had something to do with how much lower the mean fitness of the population would be. But that's not the case, right? This derivation shows that it's only the mutation rate that matters, not the reduction in fitness in individuals that have those mutations. So this result is called the Haldane Muller principle, and we've seen these people before, right? Haldane was from the modern synthesis. Muller was from Muller's Ratchet. He thinks a lot about deleterious alleles. And the reason this works is because imagine what's happening in a population with these deleterious alleles. Deleterious alleles are being created by mutations and then removed by selection. If they have major effects, then selection will remove them more quickly so although they'll reduce the fitness of individuals, they'll hang around for shorter amounts of time, they'll be lower frequencies. On the other hand, mutations that reduce fitness by a little bit will be more slowly removed by selection, and they'll hang around for longer periods of time at a higher frequency and end up affecting more individuals. And those processes completely cancel each other out, and so the only thing that becomes important is how often those deleterious alleles are being produced. And that makes sense conceptually when we think about it, and it's actually um, demonstrated mathematically here, but when it was first derived, it was kind of a surprise. Everybody expected the severity of the mutations to have an influence on the genetic load. Now this is the genetic load for these non-recessive mutations. For recessive mutations, there's a different genetic load that we end up deriving, and that genetic load is actually equal to the mutation rate, not twice the mutation rate. And that's another one of your homework questions, is doing the derivation, and again, following steps like this, but starting off with that different equilibrium frequency for a recessive deleterious mutation, in using that to derive this different genetic load. And again, in that derivation that you'll be doing, you won't have to make any of these approximation steps um, like we did for this non-recessive case.